Okay, so my name is Kata Anderle and I will speak about Cable Aging Management Program and activities at MPPs, which we, which we do for our MPPs in uh, the Czech Republic. So the content, uh, first uh, obligatory part, I will introduce uh, briefly our company and workplace and our scope of work, or, like what we are doing. I don't know, probably not all of you know us. Uh, then I will get to the main part, which is Cable Aging Management Program. And in the end, if I have time, I will describe the specifics of work at uh, MPP, meaning like uh, to describe how a work day for us looks like when we go there. So uh, I work for EJV, which is Nuclear Research Institute, uh, and uh, I work at the uh, Radiation Chemistry and Environmental Qualification Department. And uh, here's the list of our main activities. Uh, the main are uh, the first three, it's equipment qualification and cable aging management together with uh, radiation processing. And here I will spend a few words about equipment qualification, as, which is the most important for us from the business point of view. And then I will focus for uh, the cable aging management in the rest of the time. Uh, next, we are, as you see, because I'm here, we, are, we, we take part in international activities and also we do some research and we are accredited testing laboratory. Here you can see the area of our company. It's uh, on the riverbank of Vltava River. So equipment qualification. Uh, so we qualify equipment for the use at the nuclear power plants, including simulation of uh, thermal and radiation aging uh, or simulation of conditions uh, of design excellence and beyond design excellence, mainly LOCA and also including verification of function of the equipment during these simulations. So this is basically what uh, Jeremy was speaking about yesterday, like the final part of uh, the qualification. We can be this, uh, this third uh, body, the independent uh, qualificator. And uh, what do we uh, qualify? What are these equipments? Uh, it's very wide list. Uh, these are from electric cables, connectors, valves, fiber optic cables to cable penetrations, sensors, paintings, but also thermal insulation or epoxy piping. Uh, equipment qualification is closely connected with the uh, parameters of uh, the environment where uh, the equipment is working. So uh, the, main import, uh, the most important age-related stressors are following. It's uh, uh, on the first place, it's uh, elevated temperature or temperature cycling. Uh, next, of course, is ionizing radiation, then it can be humidity, vibrations, or also various seismic events. Uh, it can also be chemical attacks, uh, for example, influence of the contamination solution. But also it can be loading to various types from wear or abrasion to switch off on cycling uh, through hydraulic pressures, uh, connector plug unplugs or mechanical. It can be, for example, some hoses uh, that is bending, so you have to simulate uh, some certain number of the bending uh, during its lifetime and so on. And of course, stressors during accident conditions. So let's move to the main part. So cable aging management program. Uh, I say that it's a set of activities which uh, provides various data about material aging. Uh, or it is a controlled, uh, sometimes accelerated thermal and radiation material aging. Uh, what is it good for? It serves for prediction of the material state over time, and it presents a basis for decision making of MPP's cables lifespan. Uh, since the cable aging management is taking place in MPPs, we have some specific of this work. Uh, the main issue is that uh, our power plants, uh, which we are uh, operating nowadays, their uh, original design lifetime was between 30 and 40 years, but uh, nowadays we want to operate them as long as safely possible, which can be from 50 years uh, or even longer. Of course, cables must be always in a condition that they can operate uh, during accidents. And uh, another uh, specific, which is very important for us, which makes the work a little bit harder, is that uh, the power plants are not accessible during operation. You can enter and work there only uh, during short period of reactor shutdown. This usually takes uh, place once in a year and takes around 50 days for each unit. So you have to plan your work accordingly. 
So here we can see some kind of uh, lifetime or like timeline, which uh, shows the lifetime of the cable, or we can say generally of uh, some equipment at nuclear power plant. Uh, here, there is uh, installation date of this equipment or cable, and this doesn't have to necessarily be the same date when uh, the power plant was put in operation. Uh, today, we find this uh, cable in some better or worse actual condition, and uh, behind it, there is some used lifetime. But the, uh, the most important part is the resident lifetime uh, for, for the equipment, and uh, we need to determine this uh, as precisely as possible, like so that we know how long we can uh, operate this, this equipment. So uh, we have to find out the actual condition as precisely as possible. But there are these specifics, again, of nuclear power plants, uh, because we have to do so without cable removing from the plant, but also without cable disconnection uh, from the device. Just uh, the power plant, the staff, they won't allow us due to all the regulations and legal, legal uh, aspects. Uh, I will show you later some examples of uh, actual condition, how it looks like in the power plant. But first, uh, just to get an idea of what is the situation in the Czech Republic, we have two nuclear power plants uh, called the Kovany and Temelin. Both of them have power around 2000 megawatts. So both of them are Soviet type, uh, but just the Temelin is newer, so it's with Westinghouse INC. Uh, as I said, the Kovany is older, put in operation in 85, and Temelin newer. It works since 2000. Uh, next, to get an idea about the uh, cable situation in the, in the power plants, uh, we see that uh, in Dukovani we have uh, more than 70,000 safety cables, and uh, in Tamarin we have uh, nearly 50,000. Uh, this means that uh, per unit it's something around uh, an average 20,000 cables, safety cables. Uh, these cables are of uh, from 250 to 300 uh, types, and uh, they are uh, further uh, divided into uh, 100 or 150 reference cables. Uh, what is a reference cable? It is it is a cable which groups uh, several cables into into one group and uh, of of similar material construction of uh, type or and so on so it uh, makes it easier for you to somehow uh, to somehow sort the cables because 70,000 is obviously too much to to take care of uh, all of them so now uh, some examples of actual condition uh, before i start i wanted to ask uh, how many of you were uh, have ever been to the nuclear power plant like inside the containment if you can raise a hand just I'm curious. Okay. No in I know. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I will show you some pictures how it looked like. So when I started working in UJV, uh, I mean, I saw these pictures. I had no idea where it's up and down, left and right. What do I see? But generally, there is some construction metal carrying these cables, which are penetrating the room up or or uh, horizontally. Uh, if you come on a visual inspection of this room, uh, you say that you are quite unlucky. But here we are quite lucky sitting here in the presentation because we can see at least some cables which are clean, which are uncovered, and like they are visible. But if you come for a visual inspection, you want when you open the door, you want all the cables to be covered in a fire retardant spray, which can you see here or here. This is a new one, or also here. Because if you come there and everything is covered with the spray, obviously there is nothing to check because you don't see anything. So it's like a jackpot because it's finished. It's finished fast, this visual inspection. Next example here, uh, these are the cables in uh, cable trays, and uh, these are placed almost everywhere, not only inside the building, but also, uh, we can say that uh, the whole area of the power plant is undermined with the uh, corridors underneath. And inside there are these uh, cable drives uh, with cables. And they can be in better or worse conditions. So from time to time, there is some water penetration underground and uh, there is a very, very big corrosion of these, of these uh, cable drives. So this is a good condition. Here we can see cable vans coming through the containment. This is also a good condition, but you have to check it in detail when you go there. 
And another another example here are some cable risers with uh, cable trays, and the cables are penetrating it like through floors upside or horizontally from room to room. Okay, so let's imagine that uh, inside the power plant you have a cable, and you need to know uh, what is its residual lifetime, how long you can operate it. So you need to get as much information as possible. And uh, for this, you can use cable aging management program, like uh, the parts in which you collect the data, which you can use later for this decision. So you, we have four main parts of uh, cable aging management program. And uh, first is cable harvesting at NPP. Uh, I would say that is the best method, but it's quite complicated because it's uh, it can be very difficult to take the used uh, cable outside NPP because the due to regulations and everything. So you are quite lucky if if you are able to do it. But then you have a good source of information of the cable if it's the same type, of course. Uh, then a second uh, option is uh, cable condition monitoring. Uh, it means that uh, we are putting some uh, measurement uh, mainly of temperature and radiation inside uh, like mm, continuously inside the whole uh, nuclear power plant and then we have uh, information about uh, the condition in the rooms so if the cable goes through i don't know can be 10 rooms then you have to choose the worst one the most harsh uh, conditions and according to this you can predict uh, the third option is to do visual inspections, which is cheap and easy method, which we, we, we could uh, see in the previous images. And finally, you can set up uh, cable deposits with cable samples, but this is quite time demanding, this option. So now I will go point by point uh, through these options. So cable harvesting and NPPs. Uh, as I said, uh, at first it was not possible. We were told that all the cables are contaminated, that it is very complicated, and that these cables are waste. And uh, if we were lucky enough to get the cable, it was uh, usually without any identification, without label. But then somehow, uh, after some discussions, NPP's approach changed. Uh, there came new people in maintenance departments, and they recognized can benefit. Uh, it contributed for the change also that the regulatory body required real samples for LTO, so we had to get it from uh, the power plants. So it became possible. Then we can move to environmental monitoring, the second option. This is a very important part of aging management program, but uh, not only for cables, we can use it for all the equipment. And through this, we uh, we get the data about temperature, dose rate of, of ionizing radiation, but also it can be about neutron fluences and about humidity. Uh, it is important to mention that uh, real measured values are usually lower than design parameters, which results in longer lifetime. And this is what everybody wants to hear, because if you have some cable which is about to finish its um, originally uh, qualified lifetime, the best option is to find out that it was designed for, let's say, I don't know, 70 degrees in uh, those rate one gray per hour. But if you measure the parameters in the most harsh uh, environment in the room, uh, you can find out that actually the maximum temperature is can be, I don't know, 50 degrees, which is 20 degrees lower, and uh, those rate can be also low. So through this, you can recalculate and say, okay, it will last uh, even 10 more years. A uh, brief history of environmental monitoring in our conditions. Um, so it started in 95. I don't remember this. I wasn't part of it. Uh, and since 98, we have systematic measurement. Uh, nowadays, thousands of measurements were done at both uh, MPPs in the Czech Republic. Uh, we started in the containment and we continued outside and we still continue. So there are only many, many, uh, many measurements which requires uh, pretty precise systematization of the data, of the collected data. So here are the examples, uh, temperature monitoring. We use data loggers, uh, which is like a black box. It's self-powered recorder, and uh, you can have up to four external temperature sensors. So here we can find one at the ceiling, here and one at the cable protection tube, and here it's hidden inside a lead box. Uh, I will, we will see it on the next picture, it's this one. Uh, this we use when we want to measure some condition parameters inside the containment near the primary loop line. 
because there is there can be quite high uh, radiation dose rate and it can destroy the data logger or its data memory. So we, we cover it inside a shield, shielding lead box, which are produced just for this for its use. And here you can see that the systematization is necessary because when you look at the picture, I don't know, two, three years later, it's difficult to find uh, where the monitor was placed. So here we have one, there's another, or here at the ceiling near the pipeline. Here are some outputs of the measurement, how it looks like. For example, here, this is in Tamlin MPP on the reactor hall. We had a measurement of uh, temperature and humidity on lighting at the ceiling. So then if you have a cable up there and you want to check what is the condition, you go into cable aging uh, program and you check the data. So here you can see that at the ceiling, there is temperature around uh, 40 degrees maximum, 42 maybe, and uh, humidity around 10%. Here you can also see that here uh, the shutdown finished and the temperature rose to the operating uh, level. And then uh, in the end, when next shutdown started, it dropped again. Uh, next interesting measurement was done in uh, on a reactor pressure vessel on the surface. It's uh, on this part on the reactor. Here you can see uh, the, the wires from the data logger. And this is the output. So we see that there was the temperature on the surface of the reactor vessel is from 200 to 250 degrees. Next part of the monitoring is ionizing radiation monitoring. We do this uh, with alanin dosimeters. So here is the example how it looks like, and it's covered inside such a vessel. And then further, we, we hang it uh, on various positions. Here it's hanged uh, under the ceiling. Again, here you have to look like carefully where it is. So the systematization is very necessary. Here we have one dosimeter, here's another. And here's the third one. So it's quite difficult to find it inside, inside the plant. When you come there after a year, you forgot where you put it. So you can, if, if you don't uh, plan accordingly, it can take a lot of time to find it very, very good. And here you can see how we systemize data, the data management. We use for this uh, our own software system. Uh, and this is the module for environmental parameters. So here, uh, this is for uh, MPP Demelin, I guess, and uh, here uh, you have various floors, so and some other layer buildings. So here, if you choose the floor, for example, this minus 6.5 meters, if you click on it, you see this. This is a background from AutoCAD, and uh, these dots uh, means radiation dose uh, measurement, and here, this is for temperature. And if you further, if you choose one, for example, this part, you need to check uh, condition in uh, the cable which is placed here is working. So you, you click on it and you see the details. So here it's written like uh, by which uh, data org it was measured. Uh, there is some description how to find it, where precisely it was placed. Uh, this is the term uh, in which you, you were uh, collecting the data and some maximum and average temperature. You can also see it in the graph and here is the photo to, to, to locate it easily. Okay, third part of it was visual inspections. So we are regularly doing walk downs in NPPs and we are looking mainly uh, for this list of uh, things. So cracks and surface cracking, it can be also hardened insulation or mechanical stress. It can be also various types of uh, chemical contamination, it can be paint, oil or boric acid. And we are looking also for sources of heat hotspots, uh, which make the degradation much faster. So here I have several examples of findings. This is typical one, it's the compression by a cable clamp. We, again, we have to uh, take a photo, describe it, uh, put it into the system, and then we report it uh, to MPP staff and they decide if they need to change it or repair it or what will happen. It's their responsibility. We are just uh, like a third body who takes care of it so that it's neutral. Another example is uh, the cable, which is bended around sharp edge, uh, so the jacket can cut easily through this. So we report it and then either have to protect it somehow or, or uh, trace it around. Here, typical one, typical finding, correct cable jacket. I would say that it's a connection of uh, hard insulation and mechanical stress in the point of bending. 
Here it's again crash cable jacket, but uh, it's because of the cable clamp, uh, of, from the pressure from the cable clamp. And this is also very typical finding. Uh, it's incorrectly attached cable to the equipment because if there was something like loca, all the moisture and humidity would get inside uh, the device. This is this is very bad, but it happens regularly. We are reporting this pretty often. Also typical one, two small bending radius. <laughs> but this is an extreme, extreme condition. Also, usually it's not that bad. And this also happens from time to time. Heat source, as I said, degradation is much faster. There is some very hot medium in this tube. So as before, as I said, findings should be managed precisely because there are many of them. So you have to systemize it carefully. And important findings, which like some of them were, like for example, this hotspot, you have to uh, you have to report it immediately, and they have to solve it usually during the current uh, shutdown. This is also example from the software, uh, the description of a visual inspection. Here you have some data, like um, like date, who did it, and so on, photo documentation. And here, first in inspection is was in uh, 2013, then it was checked in 2016. Something was repaired, something not. And it was checked again in uh, 2019, and it was finally repaired everything, so correct. And the last part, uh, how you can gain the information uh, in a cable aging management program are cable deposits. Uh, this is quite demanding, time demanding um, version. But generally, we have 40 cable deposits at both MPPs, and we store inside uh, around 450 samples. Uh, these cables age at different conditions, temperatures, and dose rates. And this example which you see here, this is a cable deposit around a primary loop pipeline, which is the most harsh uh, part where we can place it. So sources of cables for uh, these cable deposits. Uh, these can be cables harvested in the plant, as I was talking about before. Uh, then you can use cables from storage at MPP if they gives you. Uh, and you can place them inside the deposit uh, as you receive them, or you can pre-age them before installation. Or you can get uh, new cables from the producer, of course. Here are examples of cable deposits. Here is a cable tray uh, below the ceiling. And usually these uh, samples are five meters long, and they are meant for electrical uh, properties measuring. And uh, here, this is open to this, which was there before, uh, the deposit around the primary loop pipeline, it's open. And inside, we have some longer cables. It's again uh, meant for electrical properties measuring and also some uh, shorter ones. Uh, this is to simulate some bending around some edge and so on and to study uh, what is the effect. Yeah, these are also samples which are like usually half meter long and it's meant for mechanical properties measuring. Then we take it after some time to laboratory and we study there. Another uh, deposit, and this is a deposit and a corridor. Again, this is uh, the protection of the cable deposit around the primary loop pipeline because uh, many workers come there and they remove the insulation or something. So you have to protect it carefully so that because they don't know what it is, they could remove it or something. You have to put their label and protect it. And this is measured uh, distribution of uh, ionizing dose rate in the in the cable deposit around the primary loop pipeline and the and the temperatures 50 to 50 to 56 degrees. And again, the systematization. Uh, again, it's based on an AutoCAD drawing, and we we describe where uh, the deposits are located and what is the condition inside them. So the temperature and the dose rate. So to sum it up, uh, we have some activities outside MPP, which are uh, previous uh, before uh, those inside. It means planning on-site activities. It means cl work closely in coordination with MPP staff to, to decide where you need to go, what you need to check. It means sample preparation for cable deposits, for example. And it means processing of collected data later when you collect it and come back to the lab. It takes a lot of time. 
activities inside MPB when you prepare everything. Uh, so you go inside, you do some cable samples management, you do some measurement of cable electric parameters in the deposits. Uh, you do the monitoring of the environment, you do visual inspections, but also cable searching because these older lands, like uh, in Dukovany, which is older, it's uh, more visible that uh, we have many cables which are in some lists, but we don't know precisely what the cables are from where, uh, like we know from where to where they are going, but we don't know the details about uh, their aging. So we have to go and search precisely the cable, which is like in the in the in the data. And uh, now, if I have time, do I? Yeah. Uh, okay, I will just uh, briefly guide you through, uh, how to say, through the process of uh, work uh, which we are doing in the nuclear power plant because it's, it can look like that you just come, you enter, you do the visual inspection, uh, you write everything and you leave, but it's not that easy because before the action, you have to get the training and authorization, you have to uh, get the permit uh, for accesses. Uh, two of them. First one is into protected area and second one is inside the containment. And uh, both of them you need to repeat regularly once in a year and it takes usually uh, every training takes one day. So it's two days per year, but on two locations. But luckily recently it got together. Then you have to get psychological examination, which you can be granted for one or three or five years and then you have to repeat it again. Uh, then you have to get a uh, state security services examination. Uh, luckily this one, it's like once you get it, you have it. You don't have to care about it longer. And you have to uh, get a permit for photo shooting, which is quite necessary for the documentation. And it's also valid for buying you. So everything you need to, to do repeatedly and it takes quite a lot of time uh, throughout the year. Then uh, you can start planning, uh, but you have to plan according to MPP shutdown. As I said, uh, it takes place once in a year and takes around 50 days uh, for each unit. So we have six units, so usually we do six visits uh, of power plant. And uh, it's important to keep in mind that the beginning of the shutdown inside the power plant is quite hot. Uh, since you said that some uh, rooms, it can be around 60 degrees, even a little bit more. So you don't want to go there and work there 10, 12 hours even in such a hot heat. So it's better to plan it in the second half. So we have around two to three weeks to do it in some better conditions. So then you can plan works. You need to plan what, where and how. This looks easy, but uh, if you don't plan precisely, it's like uh, it can be like a labyrinth inside. If you don't know where you need to go and like where the room is, on which floor, and so on. It can be also difficult to find the entrance to the room. You can spend inside a uh, lot of time or like waste it uh, just uh, with looking for the proper location. So also you have to plan quite ahead, two to three months. Uh, this is connected to the cooperation with MPP staff. It's just so because it takes a lot of permits, as I said. And also you have to check uh, carefully the accessibility of wanted rooms because into some rooms you need special keys, in some you don't. In some rooms you need special permits, in some you don't. And in some rooms you have to keep in mind that you have to deactivate the file alarms because before you go inside. So it's like all the time you are in the stress so that you don't violate some rule and don't like shoot off the whole power plant. Uh, usually we are doing these works in four people. We work in two groups and it takes us uh, two to three working days. Uh, so when we are planning the works, we have to cooperate closely with the MPB staff. Uh, together with them, we define the scope of works. They say where it's necessary to go, where can be some problems, and we say where we want to go to, for example, set up our measurement for uh, environmental monitoring. And uh, together with them, we prepare all the forms, requests, permits. For example, it's also necessary for country, and it's necessary to have a permit for uh, tools uh, to, to carry them inside. You have to name all the tools in uh, like scissors or everything and you have to, when you are leaving, you have to again show that you have everything, that you didn't forget anything inside. So now we prepared everything for the action so we can go to the power plant. Let's go. Usually we set off on Monday and we spend, we set off on Monday early morning, like 5 a.m. and we spend almost whole day with the paperwork, like to get all these permits. And also we have to go for internal contamination detector. Uh, you have to go there when you when you are planning to work inside the containment. And when you are leaving, you have to go there again to check that, that uh, nothing bad has happened. 
Next on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, these are work days and usually we work from eight to 12 hours. You are inside containment usually, so uh, you can't eat or drink. It's pretty hot there and little space. So it's very demanding. And uh, still you have to enter there. It takes usually around 40 minutes, one hour. It depends to get through all the gates and checks and uh, luck factor. By this, I mean that you never know which door will want you go through because uh, you put there a card and something happens. The door doesn't open. So you call and you need to find out what happened because there are so many permits. It can happen that you forget something or something expired, or it can just easily happen that the guy at the, at the computer, he made some mistake while putting the data inside the computer. It also happened. So then you have to go, for example, you are at the containment at the door and you need to go all the way back to the, to the main gate of your power plant. It can take you, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes, you solve it there if you are lucky and you go back. So another 40 minutes. For example, for me, it happened that uh, when I was like, uh, I don't know, let's say 15 minutes behind the main uh, main gate, uh, there was a door, I wanted to pass through and it didn't let me. And I was sure that I have everything like all right, all the permits. And nobody knew what happened, so I had to go back and it turned out that the guy who was writing it inside the computer, he, he wrote there that I don't wait 83 kilos, but he wrote uh, 38. It was like there was a weight under the door and said, OK, this doesn't correspond. So <laughs> even problems like this can occur. And uh, by this, I mean going nowhere, doing nothing, because it looks like you are going somewhere, carrying papers, getting uh, them signed and so on. So it's not like when you are doing the proper work for which you came there, but it's not possible to skip it. So finally, the work is done. You can go back to the office and process the data. It takes it can take days. When this is done, or even earlier, you have to start planning again the next visit of the, of the next unit. So it's never ending story. So that's it. That's all from me. Do you have any questions? So if you current. Does the current transmit? No, current. No, no. In these samples, you mean, which are in the deposits? Yeah. No, 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 no. These are deposits which are not uh, loaded. Do you think it might change something? Mm, there can be some, only that some, that there is absence of some uh, gel heating or so on, so that um, it's not that severe as it would be under operation. But also many cables are in operation or there is power only some small amount of time during the operation. So it depends from cable to cable. Yeah, uh, if I could uh, like answer your question, uh, we are doing currently a research on, on this. Yeah, uh, that's one correct. Of, one of our colleagues is doing a research on this topic and uh, the first like results is that 90% of the cables are not uh, like um, in loaded. In fact, with the uh, Jaws uh, heat. So, uh, so it's like ten percent of the cables which is uh, influenced by this. So, it's uh, and uh, and currently we are like processing the data and uh, finding the cables which might be influenced by this and how much. So there is a, a project also on this uh, as a part of the cable aging management management program. So, yeah, but this is quite difficult to find a uh, like the best solution because uh, they will like it is not possible to measure the cables which are really um, under power in the power plant and uh, in the same time it's not possible to somehow artificially uh, power the cables which are in the cable deposits so like in the condition of the power plant it's impossible to, to solve it so that's why we have this project. So, uh, question: um, Do you know if some online monitoring solution are usually used in, in MPP or? You mean in other MPPs? Yeah, or in yours, or I don't know. Uh, do you know if, if it's something you usually do or not? In our MPPs, it's only us who is doing it, and in others, uh, I'm not sure. I don't have such a international experience, but uh, as I know from my boss. Uh, some power plants are doing it, but they are like in, usually in the beginning. They don't have so, so many measurements and covered all the all the locations in the power plant. It's 
not a classical method to estimate the capability. Probably we can say that it's not classical, but it gives you very precious data. Okay. So, so maybe one from my side. So typically for the cables, you don't do it. So that you have a couple of uh, medium voltage permanent drives where you monitor uh, the motor impact, the temperature winding. So you, you have a temperature measurement in the winding of, of the machine. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, uh, the, for, for big drives, for instance, big permanent drives, the, the operator normally use uh, does know also the, the, the time the machine is running. So after one year or over an outage, he can tell you the, the switch on, switch off ratio of the machine. And you will also have the, the temperature recording of over the period of time, but from the motor winding up for the cable. Okay, okay, interesting. But you don't check any electrical properties like I don't know, some, some delta or or KVP or something like that. No, it's just to measure the temperature and so so for the motor windings typically it's, it's the it's the temperature uh, yeah. in okay. the winding, and then during the outage there are tests on on, on the motor itself. Okay. Yeah. So from from that information, you can somehow deduct some also some information for the cable, but typically you don't have the right temperature measurement on the cable. Okay. Is it all? Question? 